perfect. All right, everybody, what's going on? And welcome to today's edition of Swag Talk. This is the show we cover the swag inside and out. I'm your tour guide around the swag. See what's coming at you. And today we're going to recap week five, man. We are six weeks into the season, counting week zero. Um, we are in swag play now. Um, you're pretty much going to have swag games from now to the end of the season. So now is the time for teams to start to make their move. Um, some teams are going to start moving up. Some are start going to move it down. Um, we're starting to get a better idea who some of these teams are. Some teams still have a few questions. We don't know who they are yet, but that's going to be answered um, in the next couple of weeks. So um, with that being said, as usual, you can check out the socials. We have our weekly show preview, pre weekly show schedule on, on the socials. Facebook is Swag Talk, Instagram, Swag Talk, Twitter, Swag Talk 76. Also, just a little bit of housekeeping, man. You know, um, this month is uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And... Um, the company my wife works for, Park Lane Jewelry, they um, are asking for your support. They have a Hope necklace that can be purchased uh, for only $20 with a minimum purchase, and 20% of that goes directly to breast cancer research. So if you're interested in that, uh, check out parklanejewelry.com uh, backslash a backslash, uh, backslash 960903 9. Um, the link will be in the description also if you want to check that out. Also, they got a lot of other great stuff, so if you want to check that out, man, hit that link in the description. Um, also, um, if you, uh, hit that subscribe button to join, to become a subscriber of the channel, man. We are over 100, over 1,100 subscribers, and we want to keep growing. So, man, if you haven't subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button. Um, you get the join button to become a member, or if you would like to just support the show um, in any other way, um, you can hit the cash app, which is our dollar sign swag talk. Um, anything will be appreciated um, on either end. Uh, also, like the video, share it, and feel free to comment your thoughts on week five and what you know what what you expect uh, in the upcoming weeks or how your team has looked so far this season. Uh, who's a surprise team right now? Who's a disappointment? You know, and all of that. So, um, with that being said, man, um, we'll have our well, top ten dropping on Tuesday, along with any tidbits of information that comes out of the uh, coaches teleconference on Monday. And uh, we'll talk about the HBCU uh, point spreads. All of that will all be on Tuesday show. Wednesday is our week six preview. Uh, Thursday, Swag Smoke, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Eastern. And uh, Sunday is our week six recap. So got a full week of action in, on Swag Talk. Um, so y'all make sure y'all check that out. So our first game of the day uh, was homecoming in the third war. Uh, TSU picked up their first victory on on the season, defeating Lincoln by a score of uh, fifty two to seven. Um, TSU, I mean, this was their this was their game, and you know they needed a game like this really to kind of break out, you know, and, and 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 get you know get some things positive for them because they haven't really had a lot of positivity this season. So, uh, Jacory Howard uh, actually scored three touchdowns for Texas Southern on the ground. Um, Three runs, one from four, one for 36, and one from one yard out. Uh, Tigers led this game 21 to 7 at the half. Uh, Ladarius Owens also chipped in a 13 yard touchdown run. Jace Wilson had a 25 yard touchdown run. Jonathan Lewis had a 23 yard run. Uh, Travis O'Shane caught a 51 yard pass from Jordan Davis. Um, and then they got um, a, a field goal to, to wrap up the scoring. So they, you know, TSU came out and did everything that they wanted in this game. You know what I mean? This is, you know, it was homecoming, and, and you came out and took advantage. Um, held, held the Oak, uh, the Oaklanders to 238 yards of offense. Um, Tigers ran up 568 yards of offense. Great game on the ground for TSU. 376 yards rushing. Um, they averaged nine yards a carry and six touchdowns. So they got the running game going um, in a way that they hadn't got all season. 
passing game was, was solid, 16 to 26, 192 yards, uh, one touchdown, no interceptions, no turnovers for either team in this game. So pretty clean game in that aspect. Um, TSU was 6 of 10 on third downs, held opponents to 4 of 16. Uh, TSU had six sacks as a defense, made all their extra points and their only field goal attempt. So basically, like I said, this was a take care of business type of game. Uh, Wilson, 14 of 23 for 130 yards, no touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, Darius Owens ran for 139 yards and one touchdown, averaged 10.7 yards per carry. Uh, Ja'Cory Howard ran for 94 yards, averaged 9.4 yards per carry. Uh, Otis Way picked up 98 yards for uh, for Lincoln on the ground, averaged seven and a half yards per carry. Uh, Shane had the one catch with 51 yards to lead the team. Jaron Johnson led the Tigers with five catches on the night for 27 yards. Um, defensively, uh, TSU was led by um, Corey Canary Simmons with six tackles. Charles George had five. Uh, Jacob Williams had two and a half tackles for loss and two and a half sacks. Big game for him. Um, and, you know, this this was a much needed win, man. You know, coming off of that early 0-4 start, you know, 0-2 in conference, 0-2 uh, uh, in the non-conference games. This game was a game that was much needed, especially going into a bye week. Um, you don't want to you don't want to struggle in a game like this. You know, you want to take care of business and, you know, send the homecoming crowd home happy. And, and that's what they did. They were able to come out and, and, and win this game, you know, pretty. I don't say, well, I mean, you know, this is about as easy of, of a game as you could get. Uh, come out and take advantage of a weaker opponent and pick up the win, you know, um, find a way to make things happen. And they did. And I, this was a game that I, I projected um, TSU to win by a score. I think I said uh, 38 to seven. So not that far off, but, you know, the Tigers ramped up a couple more touchdowns and, and were able to get some things going right there. Um, our next game that we're going to cover is another homecoming game. Uh, another homecoming game, another blowout. This one was a bit more of a surprise uh, as far as the margin of victory goes. Uh, Alabama a and defeated Tuskegee 58-3. to I had this game being won by the Bulldogs 30-14. to and m they, they took care of business. Um, Tuskegee actually scored first. They kicked a field goal uh, early in the first quarter, and then the Bulldogs just they just they just ripped off point at the point, um, and actually had a a, a thirty a forty four a forty four to three lead at the half. So a big big um, the thirty point second quarter is the difference in this game. I mean, obviously you know Tuskegee never really slowed them down at all, but. The 30 point second quarter blew this game open. And just looking at the, the, the scores in that quarter, uh, Ryan Morrow had a 10 yard touchdown run. Keenan Hambrick had a 76 yard pass from Quincy Casey. Uh, Donovan Eaglin had a 46 yard touchdown run. They had a safety mixed in there. And then Hambrick caught a nine yard pass from Casey all in the second quarter. Uh, Jacoby Hewitt had two touchdowns in the first quarter from Casey to give the Bulldogs a 14 3 uh, first quarter lead. And then uh, they got two touchdowns in the second half, one from Jemison on a one-yard run, and then Braxton Tolliver caught a 42-yard pass from Xavier Langford in the fourth quarter to wrap up the scoring for the Bulldogs. Tuskegee had a rough, rough offensive outing, uh, only nine first downs on the night. Bulldogs held in the 70 yards on the ground and 132 yards passing, uh, two turnovers for the Tigers, 202 total yards. So. Really, really good defensive effort for AM. The passing game for AM was great again 338 yards, 18 of 28. Uh, five touchdowns, no interceptions. The run game, over 200 yards, uh, averaged 5.6 yards per carry and three touchdowns. Uh, 539 yards of total offense, uh, 8.4 yards per play. They did have one fumble. Um, but uh, this, you know, this is a game that you could, you can ask for a better game, you know, in this kind of atmosphere. Um, this is your second home. This is your third home win of the season. Um, this, you, you took care of business against your, your two D two opponents, so you know you didn't struggle in either one of those games. And that, and that's you know that's something that a mark of a team that's improving. You put fifty plus on both your D two opponents. That's that's solid. You know now it's time to get in the conference play and really start to improve week in and week out. Um, four of eight on third down for the Bulldogs. Hell, the Tigers the one of eleven. Um, Five or six in the red zone for the Bulldogs, and they had two sacks on the night. Um, individually, 
uh, Quincy Casey, 17 to 27, 296 yards, four touchdowns, no interceptions, no sacks. Great game for him. That's his second straight, really solid game. Uh, Donovan Eaglin ran for 93 yards and a touchdown, averaged 7.2 yards per carry. Uh, Ryan Morrow ran for uh, 50 yards and one touchdown, averaged 10 yards a carry. Hamburg, five catches for 147 yards and two touchdowns for the Bulldogs. Uh, in the, uh, defensively, Zarion Hayes led the Bulldogs with five tackles along with Lynn Petway. Uh, Hayes had two tackles for loss. And um, Glenn and uh, Guilford each had a, a sack apiece. Uh, forced fumble was by Petway. And he also had a formal recovery. So this is, you know, you really can't ask for a better homecoming game. I mean, that's what, home, you know, homecoming is about coming out and sending your fans home happy, you know, winning the game and, you know, putting on a show. And that's what that's what Alabama and them did in this game. They came out, they put on a show, they, they picked up a win, and now they move on to um, move back in the conference play. Uh, our next game we're going to cover um, is Southern and Pine Bluff. Um, this was a game I had Southern winning, but I had Southern winning the game by score is 24 to 17. Southern defensively won this game. Um, 27 nothing Jaguars win. Um, best first half Southern, best half period Southern's played all season was the first half. Um, offensively, they opened up a little shaky interception on the first pass of the game, but after that, um, Harold Blood was 17 for 17 for a long stretch of the game. Um, Another turnover. Southern turned the ball over two times. Defense forced four turnovers, three fumbles, and an interception. Uh, Pine Bluff had a couple opportunities early in the game to score. They got in the red zone twice, came up short both times. Um, but other than that, Southern didn't really give up much um, as far as defensively. Um, second half, um, Southern had a couple opportunities cut short by penalty. Uh, Pine Bluff played a little bit better defensively in the second half, and and that that led to the score being what it was. Uh, Southern scored first. Uh, Chandler Whitfield caught a 42-yard pass uh, from Harold Blood in the first quarter. And then they got a 22-yard field goal from Joshua Griffin to wrap up the first quarter scoring. Second quarter, uh, August Peake caught a 30-yard pass from Harold Blood. Um, and then with nine seconds left before the half, Josh Griffin kicked a 42-yard field goal to send Southern into the locker room up 20 to nothing. Um, at the uh, Golden Line fumble, Garrett Quarles got a 33-yard touchdown run for Southern um, to, for their final score of the night to make the score 27 nothing. Um, if you're Southern, you like the explosiveness, explosiveness three, uh, long touchdowns. Um, you don't, if you don't, what you don't like is not being able to finish drives uh, and definitely not being able to, you know, really punch in touchdowns in the red zone. Um, other than that last second, first half field goal, um, the offense, once they, were able to get close to scoring position or in scoring position, they couldn't really cash in. And that's that's something that's got to be improved on. Um, defensively, they didn't really allow a lot. Southern's best running game on the on the year ran for 230 yards, averaged 5.3 yards per carry. Uh, they were 20 or 25 passing, uh, two touchdowns with the one interception, 258 yards of passing offense, finished with 488 total offense, 7.2 yards per play. Uh, Pine Bluff ran for 116 yards on the night. Um, 2.4 yards per carry. Unfortunately, two pound glove running backs went down. Hopefully, those guys will be able to bounce back. Um, Jonas Davis had a couple carries, but went out hurt a couple times. Uh, Michael Jamerson went down with an injury. So, hopefully, both those guys are able to bounce back um, and, and, and play because both of those guys are really solid backs and uh, they can help that offense. And you just don't want guys to get hurt. So, hopefully, those guys can uh, bounce back. Uh, the passing game was was not where Pine Bluff really wanted it to be. Uh, they were 13 or 21 on the night for 105 yards. Uh, no touchdowns, one interception. Finished with 221 a total offense, uh, 3.2 yards per play. They fumbled three times and lost all three. Uh, penalties continue to play Southern 8 for 68. Um, Southern averaged, um, they averaged uh, 42 yards on punts. Pine Bluff 40.7. Southern was only three or nine on third down. So, again, third downs, penalties, you know, those are drive killers. Uh, that's, that's definitely something that Southern has to improve on if they want to be a factor in the conference race. Pine Bluff was seven of 18 on third down. Got a lot of conversions on scrambles by both their quarterbacks. Um, they were able to kind of run around and make some things happen, but they couldn't really 
finish drives either. Like I said, Southern finished with six sacks on the night, constantly keeping the Palm Bluff uh, offense off balance um, in the passing game. Harold Blood, 18 to 20 on the night, 225 yards, two touchdowns, one interception. He was sacked twice. Uh, Jalen Macon, 8 of 12 for 79 yards for the Golden Lions. He was sacked six times. Uh, Makai Higgins, 5 of 9 for 26 yards with an interception. Garrett Qualls, Southern's, 100, Southern's first 100-yard rusher this season. Finished with 15 carries, 102 yards, average 6.8 yards per carry. Kendrick Rhymes finished with 7.2 uh, yards per carry and 65 yards on nine carries. Uh, Kristen, Kirsten Rogers led Palm Bluff with three carries, six carries for 49 yards. Uh, Jamerson finished with 10 for 30. Uh, August Pete led Southern with four catches for 60 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Kobe Washington, four for 53. Whitfield, three for 58. Uh, Damon Dawkins led Palm Bluff with two catches for 35 yards with a longer 26. Uh, Jalen Campbell led Southern with 12 tackles. Derek Williams with nine. Kelby Givens finished with four tackles for loss and two and a half sacks on um, the lead Southern. Uh, Givens also had a forced fumble. Uh, Brown, uh, Marcel, and uh, Davis each had fumble recoveries. Carter had an interception for Southern. Defensively, Pine Bluff was led by Rico Dozier with 13 tackles. Um, Kyle Knox had a tackle for loss and a sack. Um, Clark and Fleming each had a half a sack. Uh, forced fumble was by Clark. He also had a fumble recovery. Interception was by Kyle Knox. Um, Pine Bluff, you know, this is a this is a young team, man, and you can see that youth in them um, in certain aspects. I do think as long as Coach Hampton can keep those guys um, buying in and keeping them positive and, you know, not really getting down on themselves, um, you know, for not picking up the wins yet, um, I think this team can be a, a, a really good team in the future. This season, I don't know how many games they'll win, uh, but they're doing the one thing that I, I, I said they needed to do early in the season, and that's compete. I mean, I, you know, sometimes the games don't go your way. Sometimes the scores don't go your way. But as long as you keep fighting, those opportunities are going to come for you. And, you know, a team like this doesn't have the numbers to battle injuries, so they definitely have to avoid that kind of stuff. But individually, they have a – bunch of guys that can make some things happen they just have to start to put it together so hopefully you know coach Hampton can keep the energy up on those guys and they can continue to navigate forward and those wins are coming for Pine Bluff at some point um fam you this you know this is fam you beat Valley by score 37 31 to 7 I had fam you win this game uh I think 41 to 6 so not you know again not that far but far enough off to not be right on my prediction as far as scores go but um palm blood i mean fam you this is this has been their their recipe for a lot of games you know tight you know not really great in one half you know and then a big second half or a big first half and then kind of a lull in the second half defensively strangle the other team offensively kind of find ways to hang around and then make you know make an explosive quarter and put the game away um, they led this game 10 to 7 against Valley at the half and 21 points in the second half put this game over the top. Um, fam, you scored on a fumble recovery for a touchdown um, to open up the scoring, and then they got a field goal in the, uh, late in the first quarter to, to take a 10 to nothing lead uh, into the second quarter. Uh, Jacoby Thomas got a five yard pass from Jamari Jones to get Valley on the board to make the score 10 to 7, and that would be your halftime score. Um, Fam, you would get a five-yard touchdown run um, with 201 left in the third quarter to make the score 17 to 7. And two fourth quarter touchdowns passes from Musa, one from six to uh, Kobe Gross, and one from 50 34 to uh, Marcus Riley would be the final two scores for, for Fam you as they would win this game 31 to 7. Um Valley was competitive. You know, they they for whatever reason they're they're pretty, you know, they 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 hang around at home. You know, Valley is a tough place to play. It's tough for a lot of reasons, not necessarily um, for the crowd or not necessarily for the team on the field, but a lot of things that go into the lead up of the game and, you know, the actual get into the game. And, you know, the, the, the you know, I think every conference has that one team that they're not good and they're not really going to beat you at home, but their environment makes it hard for you to stay focused sometimes. And um, you see more teams play like this at Valley than away from Valley um, against them. 
So, uh, fam, you finished with uh, a 304 total offense. Um, not a great night for them. Uh, 128 yards rushing, finished with 6.1 yards per carry. Um, they did have one rushing touchdown. 176 yards passing, 15 to 28, two touchdowns, with one interception. Uh, like I said, 304 yards of offense. Only 49 plays ran for the Rattlers, 6.2 yards per play, no fumbles. They had 13 penalties for 106 yards. That's always going to make a game look closer than it, it should be. That's a drive ender. That's a, you know, against some teams, that's a drive extender. But um, in a game like this, this that's most likely a lot of drive ending penalties or uh, drive slowing penalties. Valley uh, finished the night with 149 yards. Again, that dark cloud defense did not give up m much of anything. Uh, Valley ran for 80 yards on the night, 1.8 yards per carry. They passed for 69 on the night, 17, 7 of 17 passing, one touchdown, uh, no interceptions, 149 yards of offense. 2.4 yards per play. They did fumble once and lost it. Uh, they had eight penalties for one uh, for 51 yards. Fam, you averaged 44 and a half yards per punt. Valley 37.2. Uh, two of nine on third down for Fam. You that like I said, they did not play a, a great offensive game in this game. Um, and you can you can point to all the reasons why they only had the ball for 23 minutes. Um, Valley had control of time of possession, time of possession, 36 minutes to, and 14 seconds to 23:46. Uh, Valley was only three of 13 on third down, uh, one of four on fourth down. Uh, Valley did go one for three in the red zone, so they missed two scoring opportunities in the red zone. They missed a field goal. Um, fam, you had one sack on the night. Um, they did make all the extra points on one field goal. Against a you know against a team with a better offense, this may have been a t you know this may have been a, a, a game that fam you would have been on the ropes, but they you know that defense never let Valley get anything going. And when your defense plays well like that, you know, when you have those bad offensive nights, you know, you can kind of limp your way through a game like this because you know you, you know your defense is going to bail you out of pretty much any hole that, that you put them in. Um, eventually, you don't want to keep counting on your defense to do that. Um, but when, you know, when you have the ability to, to get out of those jams, uh, sometimes you kind of lean on it a little bit. Um, and a game like this is definitely one of those games. Uh, Jamari Jones finished 7-17 or 17 for Valley. For 69 yards, one touchdown, and one sack. Uh, Jeremy Musa, 13 of 26 on the night, 155 yards, uh, two touchdowns, one interception, uh, no sacks. Kelvin Dean, seven carries for 48 yards to lead the Rattlers, 6.9 uh, yards per carry. Uh, Jared Wilson led Valley with 18, 18 carries for 42 yards. Uh, Jacoby Thomas, 11 for 41. Marcus Riley led Family with two catches for 99 yards and one touchdown. Uh, Kobe Chambers led uh, Valley with four catches for 53 yards. Johnny Chaney led FAMU with nine tackles. Um, Horn and James, I mean, excuse me, Horn, Horn and Ash each had two tackles for loss apiece. Uh, Ash had a sack, uh, interception, no interception, no force formal for the Rattlers. Valley was led by uh, Ryan Quinney with six tackles. Also, Omar Emons with, with six as well. Uh, Jordan Bussey had one and a half tackles for loss to lead the team. No sex. Uh, interception went to Christian Fagan for Valley. Two teams going in different directions. Valley has to find a way to to start to find some kind of momentum. Um, offense has steadily declined in points um, as the season's going on. They scored 21 in week one. Uh, six. Uh, no, uh, let me see. 21 in week one. Uh, the next game they scored. I got to find it. Twenty-one in week one, seven in week two, in week three, uh, week four they scored three, and then this past week they scored seven. So they had, you know, they're not able to put the points on the board at all this this season. Uh, they have to find a way to start to score points because. You can't win if you don't score. And the offense is not moving the ball. Uh, you're putting a lot of pressure on the defense that's already, you know, doesn't have a lot of numbers. Um, you're putting a lot of pressure on them to constantly go out there and, and, and hold teams. And and eventually they break like they did in the second half of this game. And that's that's the pattern that you're going to see from Valley a lot until they can start to move the ball and, and find some things to be positive. Uh, our next game is an overtime game. Um, Alcorn. 
lost the game 23 to 20 on a last second field goal last week. This week they win a game 23 to 20 on a field goal in overtime. So um different reverse score, different weeks. Um, you know, they they had you know they 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 finding themselves in these kind of games. Uh this was a battle. Um anytime a game go to overtime, a lot of typically it's a battle. Uh all corn they had three nothing after one. Uh Noah Keanu kicked the field goal with no time left in the first quarter. Uh, Jalen Sultan got the Hornets on the board with a two-yard run uh, midway through the first quarter. They led seven to three. Uh, Keem McNair caught a 13-yard pass from Aaron Allen to give the Braves a 10 to seven lead with 6:20 left in the first half. Uh, Marcus Harris had a 10-yard run for the Hornets. Uh, extra point, no good, 13 to 10, and that will be our halftime score. Uh, Montario Hunt, 54-yard pass from Allen, uh, extra point, good, gave the Braves a 17-13 lead. Uh, James Burgess would block a field goal and return the 75 yards for the Hornets to make the score 20 to 17. Uh, with no time left in the game, Keanu kicks a 24 yard field goal um, to tie it up at 20, and then he wins the game in overtime um, with a 23 to 20 win for the Braves. Um, Alcorn, they, they got the ball on 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 their first on the first position of overtime and got the field goal. Alabama State got the ball second, knowing they needed a field goal to tie, touch down the win. Um, they got down to the uh, all corn eleven, and Davis got sacked um, for a nine a nine yard loss on third and seven. And Jaden John missed a field goal from thirty yards out that would have tied the game up uh, and sent it to a second overtime. So, just you know, a, almost a typical Alabama State offensive possession in that last that last possession. Um, Davis ran for five yards on first down. Uh, second down, uh, Harris ran for six to get them a first down. Um, Harris ran for a loss for, for no gain on first down. Uh, second down, Davis complete for three yards to the off point 14, and then Davis got sacked um, and missed field goal. So just still offensively, Alabama State still really can't really get it going, but they had a great game on the ground this week. You know, that, you know, that's been something that they hadn't really done well. Uh, they ran the ball for 257 yards this week. Um, ran the ball 50 times. So they were committed to running the football this week. Um, 5.1 yards per carry, two touchdowns on the ground. All corn only 58 yards rushing. Um, they only ran the ball 19 times. That's surprising to me. Um, all corn threw the ball 46 times in this game and ran it on 19. That's such an un all corn outing, um, especially to win. Um, but they ran the ball for 19 times, uh, 3.1 yards per carry. Uh, Alabama State only threw the ball for 96 yards, 12 or 18. Um, no touchdowns, no interceptions. Alabama, uh, all corn, 370 yards through the air, 32 or 46, two touchdowns, one interception. All corn, 428 yards of offense, average 6.6 .6 yards per play, no fumbles. Uh, Alabama State fumbled the ball seven times in this game. They lost three. Um, that's that's really in a game like this. Those turnovers are the are the difference in this game. Um, Sixty eight plays for uh, the Hornets, three hundred fifty three yards of offense, uh, five point two yards per play. Like I say, seven fumbles, lost three. That's that's a killer. Uh, four thirteen on third down for Alcorn, six of fifteen for the Hornets. Alcorn was one for one on fourth down. Alabama State was one for one as well. Uh, Alcorn two sacks, the Hornets three individually. Um, all corn was led by Aaron Allen, 32 of 46, 370 yards, two touchdowns, one interception. Like I said, sacked three times. Damon Stewart, 5 of 10 for Alabama State for 68 yards, no touchdowns, no interceptions, one sack. Demetrius Davis, 7 of 8 for 28 yards, no touchdowns, no interceptions. He was sacked once. Uh, Jarvion Howard had five carries for 24 yards for all corn to lead the Braves. Uh, Marcus Harris led the Hornets with 10 carries for 80 yards and a touchdown. Jawan Howell, 16 for 73 on the night. Um, Montario Hunt, six catches, 109 yards and a touchdown. He, like I said, he's a guy who was a playmaker. Um, you got to get the ball in his hands. Uh, he had a great game last week. He had a really great game this week. Malik Rogers also had a good game, five for 87. Uh, Jarvion Howard had five catches for 51 yards. So he wasn't involved as much as you would like in the run game. Um, with only uh, five carries, but he did catch 51 yards. That always helps Tavares Griffin. Five catches, 46 yards. Got to get the tight end involved, man. You got to get him involved. 
Uh, Dylan Creech led the Hornets with one catch for 34 yards. Howell one for 22. Uh, Edwards led Alcorn with 13 tackles on the night. Terrence Ellis had eight. Uh, Edwards had two and a half tackles for loss along with Dawson. Also two and a half tackles for loss. Dawson and Smith each had a sack apiece. Um, Tyler Smith had two forced fumbles. Uh, Ellis, Bailey, and Kelly each had fumble recoveries. Alabama State. Led by Bubba Adams, as usual, with 12 tackles. Also one tackle for loss. Uh, Trey Quan Thomas led the Hornets with two tackles for loss and two sacks as well. Um, interception for, was by uh, Burgess. Uh, he also had a, a blocked field goal recovery. Th again, this game was kind of, you know, I, I, I thought I, I thought Alcorn would be able to, you know, run the ball a bit more. Um, but Bama State's defense is tough on the run. Um, Alabama State's running game really surprised me in this game. Um, they still have to find some kind of way to really get their consistency offensively. Um, they are finding so many ways to shoot themselves in the foot, you know, game in and game out. Um, this week, it was a lot of fumbles. You know, it was a three-point game. You know, one of those drives that ended on a fumble probably could have been the drive that won the game for you. Um, they, you know, they, they, they still have a lot of things to work on. Consistency, especially, is big on offense. And, you know, they have to commit to one guy at quarterback. You know, I mean, whether this is a guy that's banged up and you taking him out, you know, if you make a change, you you got to ride with that guy. You know, I mean, you can't keep juggling guys. That's just not going to really, really help you much. Um, our game of the week, Grambling defeats Prairie View by a score 35 to 20. Uh, Prairie View, uh, Gramlin scored first. They got a Tanner Rinka field goal in the first quarter to lead 3 0. Uh, Mar Antoine got the Panthers on the board with a, a touchdown from three yards out. They led 7 3. Uh, Rinker got another field goal for Gramlin, uh, made it score 7 6. Uh, Villa Gomez will get a field goal for Prairie View in the second quarter. They led 10 6. Uh, Rinker got another field goal for Gramlin, uh, made it score 10 9. Gramlin will get their first. First touchdown of the game with a minute and 18 left in the first half when Lyndon Rash will catch a 12 yard pass from Miles Crawley, 16 to 10. Um, Garcia Rodriguez will get a 42 yard field goal for Prairie View to make the score 16 13. Uh, Lyndon Rash will get his second touchdown of the game with 106 left in the third in the third quarter um, with a six yard pass from Crawley. Extra point, no good, 22 13. Uh, Connor Wisham will get a 53 yard run for the Panthers. To pull them to within two, uh, 22 to 20. Chance Williams will get a four yard run for Gramlin uh, to make the score um, 29 to 20. And then Floyd Chalk will get a three yard run for Gramlin to ice the game uh, at 35 uh, 20. This was a game I picked Prairie View to win by a score 34 31. I thought it would, I thought the Panthers offense would be able to generate some 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 success on the ground and, and put the points up because Gramlin has been giving up some points, but Gramlin played a really solid defensive game. Uh, held the Panthers to 126 yards of uh, of, of, off, of rushing offense, uh, 4.2 yards per carry. They did have two touchdowns on the ground. Um, Prairie View passed for 224, uh, 11 to 22, no touchdowns, one interception, 350 total offense for Prairie View, 52 plays, 6.7 yards per play. Grambling, another really good offensive outing, 208 on the ground. Uh, they averaged 5.2 yards per carry with two touchdowns. Uh, 241 through the air, 26 of 41, two touchdowns, no interceptions. 449 yards of offense for the Tigers. 81 plays, 5.5 yards per play. Gramlin finished 7 of 18 on third down. Um, Purview 3 of 11, th that's always going to be a killer. Uh, 0 for 3 on fourth down for Purview, that's also another 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 drive ender. Um, Purview was 1 or 2 in the red zone. Gramlin 6 of 6 in the red zone, 4 sacks defensively. Uh, Purview did not record a sack. Gramlin, like I said, I've been, you know, I've been kind of harping on Gramlin's defense um, at, at different points during the season, but they've come up strong defensively the last couple of weeks. And in conference play, that's when it matters the most. Um, they, they've they been a lot better on defense uh, against the running conference play. Um, haven't really given up a lot of points, you know, about an average of 20, 22 or so points a game and on on defense in, in, in conference play. So not that much offense is scoring points in bunches. And that's the recipe for success. If they can continue to score points like that and the defense can get those stops, Gramlin will be 
the front runner in the conference. Um, they're two and zero right now. Um, two divisional wins. Um, those are huge. So, Grambling sitting in a good spot. Prairie View still has some things to answer. Uh, the running game hasn't really been there um, in recent weeks. Um, they've been passing the ball a little bit more, but they they have to find a way to get some consistency. Uh, Trezon Conley, eleven of twenty two. 224 yards, uh, one touchdown. I mean, excuse me, no, no touchdowns, one interception, four sacks. Miles Crawley, 26 of 41, 241 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions, and no sacks. I was in you know, early in the season and, and preseason. I was on the uh, why y'all own, why y'all hyping Miles Crawley bandwagon. And I'm a, I'm gonna give credit where it's due, man. I think he's playing really great. He hasn't had a bad game yet this season, honestly. Um, and I would say, uh, with Musa being up and down the way he is, and and Andrew Body being out, Miles Crowley is probably the best quarterback in conference right now. Um, if he's not, then he's number two. Um, I, I mean, Musa's had some some solid games, but he's had a lot of up and down. Um, so I will give I will give Miles Crowley a lot of credit, the coaching staff a lot of credit for getting the most out of him and doing what he letting him do what he does. Um, and if you bound a mistake, man, you got to be looking crazy at your coaches for letting this guy get away. Now, he may not have been that great in that offense because that offense is helpful skeletal. But sometimes you need to leave and find the right place. And right now, he found the right place. You know, sometimes where you're at at first is not where you need to be. Um, and you have to find people that respect your skills and know your skills. And right now, Gremlin is, the, is doing that. They, they surrounding him with a good run game. Uh, Miss Week, Floyd Chalk led the team with 86 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Williams finished with 76 yards and a touchdown. They they are getting it done, and there's no other way to put it. So um, as somebody who's been hard on Hugh Jackson and Gremlin, you know, you got to give it where it's due right now. Um, and they playing really well um, at this point in the season. Uh, Mar Antoine led Purdue with nine carries with 63 yards and a touchdown. Um Trajan Spiller had four catches for 109 yards for the Panthers. Uh, Brian Jenkins, one for 43. Lyndon Rash led Groundland with seven for 73 and two touchdowns. Javon Robinson, seven for 69. Uh, Antonio Jones, six for 57. Defensively, DeJuan, DeJuan Lewis led the Panthers with nine tackles on the night. Uh, Marshall, uh, Jamal Marshall and Freddie Bird and Keyshawn Johnson each had one tackle for loss apiece. Uh, no, no sacks, no forced fumbles, no interceptions for the Panthers. Lewis Matthews led grounded with nine tackles. Javon Carter had eight. Uh, Carter led the team with two and a half tackles for loss and also two sacks. Um, interception was by Cedric Anderson. And like I say, Gremlin is, is taking care of business, and you really can't ask for a lot more from them right now. Um, they've played two straight conference games, won them both. Uh, they're sitting in a in a good spot, and we're gonna t we're gonna jump from this to the standings right now. Uh, Fam, you leads the East at three and zero. Um, they're four and one in conference. Um, all three of their wins are division wins, so that's huge in, in terms of tie, uh, tie breakers. Um, Jackson State is one and one, three and two overall. Alabama and M is one and one, three and two overall. Uh, but then Cookman zero and one in conference, one and three overall. Alabama State zero and two in conference. One and three overall, Valley 0 and 1 in conference, 0 and 4 overall. Gremlin is 2 and 0 in conference, 3 and 2 overall. Southern 2 and 0 in conference, 2 and 2 overall. Prairie View 2 and 1 in conference, 2 and 3 overall. Alcorn 1 and 1, and 2 and 3 overall. Pine Bluff is 0 and 2, 1 and 4 overall, and Texas Southern is 0 and 2, and 1 and 4 overall. So right now, the West is still anybody's game. Uh, Gremlin still has games against Alcorn. Um, Southern and Pine Bluff in the division. Uh, Southern still has all uh, still has games against Gramlin, Prairie View, Alcorn, and Texas Southern in the division. Um, not not even counting out of division games, but just in division games, they they still have a lot of games. The Prairie View is not out of it. Um, they still have to play Southern um, and Pine Bluff. Alcorn is one and one. They still have some some division games ahead of them. So the West isn't settled yet. Um, it's starting to shape up, but you know. It's not settled yet. Fam, you has a strong lead in the East right now. Um, they've already beaten Jackson State. Um, they've beaten Alabama State, and now they and now they've beaten Valley. So they they have won almost all their division games already. They still have to play A and M and Bethune Cookman uh, in the division. 
Uh, Modern division they still have some some games to play, but right now they're three and zero, and they they're sitting pretty pretty comfortably right now. So they they are definitely the team to beat in the East. On uh, the West is still anybody's game. I'm looking at Week Six. Um, I was scheduled for Week Six. Bethune Cookman is at Alabama State. That's a two p.m. kick. HBCU Go uh, is the broadcast. Gramlin is at Alcorn. Uh, two thirty kickoff. Uh, Alabama A&M plays Jackson State in Mobile in the Gulf Coast Challenge. Uh, ESPN Plus broadcast three p.m. kick. Uh, FAMU is at Southern. That's a six p.m. kick. That game is on ESPNU. And Valley is at Prairie View. Uh, that's a six p.m. kickoff. So we have five conference games. Uh, Texas Southern. I mean, excuse me. Not, yeah, Texas Southern is off, and Pine Bluff is off. Um, everybody else is in conference action. So five conference games this week. Uh, coming up, and we'll be back on Wednesday to preview all of those games. Tuesday, our top 10 will drop our HBCU top 10 and whatever tidbits uh, worth noting from the coaches' press conference and our uh, HBCU point spreads, all that will drop on Tuesday. So with that being said, I'm your tour guide around the Spike Seawell signing out, and we're going to catch y'all on the rebound. Peace. <laughs>